Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as you all know, today we have Shortcut Mojumla with us. Uh, so before uh, we begin, I just wanted to brief a little bit about Toto Fun Sea Arts. I think some of you who are, I mean, who are, don't know probably. Uh, Toto Fun Sea Arts is a not-for-profit public trust. It's set up in the memory of Toto, Angiras Toto Balani. Um, and the, the, we do several things. One of the things we do is the annual awards, which is uh, in categories of creative writing in English and Canada, and also short film, music, and photography. Uh, and uh, we also conduct workshops, like we had one today on creative writing. Uh, we also do readings, uh, you know, and, and uh, um, film screenings as well. Yes, thank you. And uh, uh, we also uh, do this series, which is called the Creative Journeys. So TFE Creative Journeys is essentially a series of talks uh, where we provide uh, you know um, provide a platform for younger or even more experienced artists, whether they are writer, filmmaker, musician, uh, photographer, you know, uh, any artist, to come and share about their creative journey, uh, which will uh, you know insights into how insights into how they create their art and uh, their artistic life itself. Uh, previous speakers have been Give Patel, uh, playwright uh, and poet, Sunil Shamba, theatre maker from Bombay, we have had Shurupa Sen, Jitesh Kalat, Sampurna Chatterjee, Shushmit Sen, Neil Chaudhary, Pallavi MD, Jayant Kaikini, and uh, Benavid. Right. Uh, so, and today in the same series, we are hosting Shaukat Mujumla. Shaukat, uh, I am just going to briefly introduce Shaukat. He is a professor of creative writing at Ashoka University. Uh, his recent book is Middle Finger, uh, it's a novel, and before that he has authored three more novels. Uh, um, uh, Middle Finger is a campus novel that examines the intricacies of teacher-student relations through the lens of ancient myth. Previous novels, like I said, there have been uh, Scent of God, which was uh, released in, which came out in 2019, which is the story of a romantic love between two boys in a Hindu monastic residential school. Uh, then before that uh, was Firebird, which was the story of a young boy's uh, relation with the art form of theatre through the, his relationship with his mother, who uh, was an actress, a uh, theatre actress. Um, Scent of God was one of Times of India's most talked about books of 2019 and also a finalist for the inaugural Matrimony Book of the Year Award. Firebird was finalist at the Bangalore Brit Festival, uh, and uh, yeah, I think it was also uh, auctioned in the World to Street Market in the Mumbai Film Festival. So we might see it as a web series <laughs> or a film sometime in the future, right? Uh, of course, Saiket also, uh, since he uh, is an academician, so he also has authored a book on literary criticism called Prose of the World, and uh, he has also written. Uh, a book on college education, which is called College, and he has also edited a collection of essays uh, titled as The Critic as Amateur. So that's about Saikat. So today, uh, so I think to begin with, Shaikat, uh, one of the things which has struck me uh, from reading of your books, essentially Fireboard and Scent of God, is that the protagonist is the child. Right? Uh, uh, Ori in uh, Firebird and then Anirvan in uh, Scent of God. So maybe it's a good idea to start with your childhood and if you can talk us through what were your early influences and how did reading and writing come into your life? Yeah. Thank you, Basa, for that very useful question. And thank you for being here. I realized while doing the workshop that it started raining at some point of time. We were inside a room, and but Basu told me that it rains in one neighborhood in Bangalore and that doesn't rain in the other neighborhood. Microclimate. So um, <laughs> thank you for braving the weather for being here. And I know there are competing events happening. So that's a it's really important question. I mean, childhood, I think, you know, as a writer, I think I've been particularly drawn to coming of age stories. And I think that has a lot to do with you know, I feel, I mean, coming of age story, obviously the word for it is the Bildung Slomut, the novel of education. And um, and education, of course, in a larger sense. 
And I feel, as somebody who's involved in education, I feel it is a wonderful thing. It obviously brings out your, you know, fullness of the human personality. But it's also a very depressive process. It sort of cuts you in size. You know, so it forces you to become a certain kind of a subject. So I think, in some ways, I have written about education, and I'm an educator. But I think in my novels, um, my protagonists fail to come of age in a way. They fail to become productive citizens. They, you know, they like in the firebird, the whole idea that you know um, one can have sexual maturity at a too early or in the center body move away from heteronormative relationships. So I guess one would seem like you know I did have a disturbed childhood, <laughs> which I think I think we all have disturbed childhoods, don't we? We all have disturbed childhoods. We all have difficult relationships with mothers, you know, <laughs> as our psychoanalyst will will attest to. Um, I mean, I I grew up in Calcutta, which uh, obviously I haven't I've lived away from Calcutta for many years. I left up right after college. I went up to the US and I lived there for many years and came back. Now I'm in Delhi. Um, and I, I think Calcutta plays a very key role. I mean, like my first three novels, my last novel, I moved in other locations. Um, I think one very important part was what Bas have already mentioned. Uh, my mother was a theater actress, and um, she passed away quite young. I mean, again, um, you know, novels are. Somebody said that um, all novels are autobiographies, and all autobiographies are lies. That you know, it's like no matter what you write, whatever you write, there's a part of yourself. And when you write an autobiography, you of course take a position, so you make up things. Um, I think I have written things taken from my life. Uh, they're not autobiographical. Like I was just telling in this um, workshop, I'll repeat it for those of you who haven't heard it. That I had this uh, terrifying memory of being at, at five year old. And this was uh, my mother was playing a role in a in, in a kind of an outdoor theater. This was happening in Kadak, and I was watching. It was mid late night, uh, and uh, and she was playing a role where she was suffering a lot and she was crying, and she was dying, and that traumatized me. That really traumatized me as a child because obviously I didn't know what was happening. Why was she crying? Why was she dying? And in a strange way, I retained that memory for a long time. Of course, I realized later that it was fake; it's not true. But then, I, when I was um, um, before moving to Ashok, I taught at Stanford for several years, and I was talking to a colleague at Stanford that you know I had this really strange memory when when he was five years old um, that um, I watched was watching my mother die on stage, and she told me that I think you have a novel there. <laughs> so the result was the firewood, which was obviously much of it was fabricated, but it starts in that moment where this terrifying memory and this inability to tell the difference between art and life—that you know, what does it mean to see your mother die on stage? What does it mean to see her kissing another man? What does it mean to see her live another life? So I'd say that has been an important part of. You know, my mother. Obviously, in reality, she died later. She was in her fifties. I was in my twenties when I was in the U.S. Um, but I think now I realize uh, my mother's artistic life. And she was a struggling actress. You know, she acted in some films, some some television. You know, some. It has left an impact. It has left an impact. I think my sense of art comes from her. My sense of art, to a degree, she educated me in literature. And um, and so I I grew up I grew up with books very much and I think because um, my parents divorced uh, when I was quite young and I think I was traumatized by that. This was I'm talking, you know, eighties mid eighties and um, I think divorces were quite uncommon at the time and um, I think for a long time I dealt with the shame that you know I um, how do I deal with it and that made me very introverted. I mean, for one thing, I realized I. Could play team sports, you know, it's like soccer, but I could play ping pong, and it's like one thing which doesn't require you to be in front of people. And then at some point of time, I think in my seventh or eighth grade, I discovered literature. And that really liberated me. That suddenly opened up a space, you know, literature, debating, and I was never very um, good. I I I I went to sort of so-called these elite schools where boys are destined to be engineers and doctors, and I never really was interested in that, and I was very oppressed by this, you know, kind of obsession with engineering, and I, and this really allowed me that space that I can do other things, and that also in some ways fed into my 
other novel, that monastic boarding school, that space I've written about is a space I've known where it's a very austere atmosphere, you know, there are monks and yet there are young boys coming of age there, they're attaining puberty and I remember this magnetic atmosphere which is austere and full of fragrance of incense and flowers and all these devotional songs and yet this boy is sitting in a prayer hall, their knees touching each other, in a way that kind of stirring and it's an age where you don't really distinguish between who's touching your man, a boy or a girl and I think I felt I had to write about that atmosphere. Again, a fictional story, but atmosphere is very important to me. So that, you know, that education took, you know, quite a bit. And since then, I think, um, I, in a way, I'm haunted by the difference between writing and performance that keeps coming back. Because I think, in some ways, I never recovered from the trauma of my mother's life as an actress. Because, uh, because of the, you know, actresses, I think in our society, certainly in the 80s and 90s, where seen as, okay, their moral life is a bit suspect, you know, there's, an in Calcutta, as in many other cities, you know, actresses, acting is linked with prostitution and a certain kind of, in fact, there's a distinguished tradition, you know, the greatest theatres in Calcutta are in the red light area, <laughs> there's a reason, so there's a whole tradition of that, Girish Kosh, and um, I think, you know, that always traumatized me, and I felt I entered into the world of books which was safe and quiet and solitary. Books is about reading. It's not doesn't have that flamboyance. And I became I read later, I did a PhD, you know, I I I, I, I chose the prose as my medium and I think my choice of prose as a medium is in a way moving away from performance. And yet when I wrote I realized I've gone back to performance. So Fireball is my attempt to capture the vibrant, savage and traditional energy of theater in a kind of more calm and rational form of prose. And in my latest novel, you know, which is about poetry and performance, like what, what happens to poetry when it's performed? You know, is it different? You know, as we speak, we have poetry going on elsewhere. So that whole sense of is embodied poetry. So I think I've been haunted by that, the idea of the solitary reader who can hide and read and write, and the idea of the actor or the performer, or the musician, I have a sense of, I almost have an envious relationship with that because I, I think for the longest time I was very awkward with my own body. And there was a time when I wanted to be an actor. Oh, I'd love to. And then of course, given acting was such a sort of infested subject, such a traumatizing subject, I realized I couldn't be and then I become a student. But I think I've retained that sense of performance. And then, you know, once you become a writer and of course, Teaching is a kind of a performance, so I think that stayed with me. And you know, we you know these days writers perform more than they write. <laughs> so reading is a performance, going to literary festivals is a performance. And I think I regain the confidence to a degree, given I'm very passionate about what I do. So okay, I may move hand, move, may move my hands too much, or I move my head too much when I see my videos. I'm like my God, what was I doing that? But at least what I spoke, I believed in it. So that is the confidence I have. So it's a you know it's a I don't know, I can't sum summarize my life, obviously, but there are all these strange influences and I and it's particularly gratifying to talk to Basav about it because Basav is a theatre artist and he makes films and Basav and I, he's read my theatre novel in an amazingly sensitive way, Firebird, and that reading will never leave me. And I think it's very gratifying whenever I talk theatre with him around because he understands that art form. And he understands the art form and its vernacular power too. It's not just English theatre, but theatre in Canada, in Bangla, in, in, in Hindi. And those have been big influences in my work. And even now I have a very special soft spot for the theatre because it does remind me of the moment when I walked into a green room and I saw my mother. Um, she had she had her uh, she had changed into her regular clothes, but she had a wig. And I I was that moment when a child feels like, is this someone I know or I don't? Is it, she looks familiar, but she's not quite familiar. So that whole sense of watching someone in makeup, and I think any of you who have acted or known people who act, you know this, that how does that happen? And I think it, not even there in film, because theater has a very lift form, or watching a play from the wings. So those are my some of my most haunting childhood memories. And as you grow older, you realize how important your childhood is. And I love 
writing about childhood, writing about child protagonists because childhood is a time of primal joys and terrors and yet children don't understand what's happening. They don't understand that a person dying on stage is not really dying. They don't understand the arrival of puberty is a certain... They don't even understand what sexual awakening is and yet their bodies are changing. And I, I think between understanding and experience lies a gulf which is a very powerful space for art. And a lot of my art has come out of that space. So in a way when I wrote my newest novel, The Middle Finger, which is about an adult, a thinking adult, a grown-up person, I was like, can I do this? I'm like, I'm, I'm comfortable with the child protagonist. And I, I just, can I even do that? So you can tell me if this has worked. But I think this is a very important time and I tell people that, you know, this, uh, I once had a conversation with an American novelist, uh, Fei Meng Nan, Vietnamese American novelist. She told me something which is, I've never forgotten. She said, the first five years is all you need. The first five years of life is a material for a lifetime of art. You don't need anything more. <laughs> I, I don't think that's necessarily true. And yet the first five years, the rawness, the vulnerability of those years are really unforgettable. So yeah, that's a very important question. Do you like to leave that passage where the body goes in search of his novel? Sure, sure. I will, um, I will read the opening of, um, of that novel because I think this is... Um, um, oh, that part you're so saying. It goes winding through the streets. Uh, oh. Yeah. Um, first few pages. Okay. Um, let me read the opening and then maybe I can skip to that. Disaster came early in Ori's life. At the age of five, the first time he saw his mother die. Around him was a warm nest of people. People who munched on popcorn, their faces lit up by the reddish yellow light of the fire pit. They looked around put their arms around him lovingly, their palms covering his eyes, and murmured, Look away, you don't have to see this. To each other they said, we should have put him to bed. They stroked him absently, unable to tear their eyes away from the slow dance of light and shadow, on which his mother floated to her death. A few hundred black heads peeped out of the cotton sheets and woolen shawls around their bodies, gazing across the open ground, hypnotized by her pain. His father hugged him, but his arms felt cold. You are crying. His voice mocked, sounding as if it was coming from far away. Dhrubuka. Ori didn't scream, but the world blurred as tears poured at the corners of his glasses. Nausea gathered in his bowels like thick mist, and the heat rose to his skin. In the blurred light, he saw his mother's head slump back as she lay on the ground. She was dead. Her long hair spread on the floor like a still pool of blood. A breath of relief reached through him. He sensed his fear evaporate and his skin turned cold from sweat. He did not know when he had fallen asleep. His father had grabbed his wrist. Come and led him through the darkness, whispering, Just hold on to my hand. Bad going. They had inched their way under their makeshift wooden structure through narrow passages veined with electric cables to the room of white light and giant mirrors. It was the kind of room you would see hundreds of times all over the country, choked with the smell of wigs and makeup and cotton and silk, charged with the sauciness of women in bras and petticoats smoking cigarettes, the coffer of Mughal princesses still heaped over their heads. That night, he had needed to see her, still heavy with gold jewelry with the rich sari, her hair a black river flowing down on her back. She caught sight of his reflection in the long mirror before her, smiled and came back to life. But she did not turn around or leave her seat to take him in her arms. He stood at the threshold for a long moment. Her smile felt strange, out of place. He had just seen her suffer a life of misery and meet her death with calm. And here she was in the green room, thick with cigarette smoke and sharp with the glare of electric bulbs lining the mirror, smiling alive. His heart leaped with happiness and a pang of betrayal. Blinded by the lights and mirrors, he averted his eyes. I think you meant uh, the part a little bit later. Yeah. So um, maybe I'll just read a little more here, this part, where he goes to look for his mother who's rehearsing. Evening hung over the place, though it was not yet six. The darkness did not scare him. He was eager to get to the theatre around the corner. 
This was, he knew, the evening for the full rehearsal with costumes and music and everything. His mother never took him to f along to full rehearsals. But he had wandered from the park where it played in the evening. With quiet determination, he had drifted through the snarl of the traffic. He knew this leads a little. Once he had come here with his mother and her friends in a car which had left him right in front of the theatre. Today, as he walked on, he caught a whiff of flowers. He looked around and realized what was different about these roadside stalls selling cigarette and palm leaves. They all sold flowers. Stems of roses and thin garlands of white evening bloomers, jasmines, tube roses, cold, moist, exquisitely formed blossoms that once saw at weddings and at funerals. Music played from the tiny transistor radios hidden under stacks of flowers and chewing tobacco. Love songs from Hindi movies, many of them from many, many years ago, crackling on the airwaves in snow nasal tones. First, he saw the men, reed thin, in shabby shirts flapping around their bony ribs, wandering the pavements. They looked aimless but worried, as if they had something on their minds but couldn't talk about it. Their bodies arched eagerly towards every passing man, to whom they turned for a few moments, whispering breathless appeals. What were they saying? He saw no merchandise on them, no pouches of chewing tobacco, trays of sliced fruits or spiced candies that vendors usually try to thrust on pedestrians making their way through city neighborhoods. He glanced at them furtively as he walked, but none of the men looked at him. Turning into a narrow lane, he saw the women. They stood next to each other in a line around the houses facing the street in a wriggling snake-like row, a scattered chain of shiny dresses, fiery red makeup on dark skin and flowers wreathed around buns and waves of hair. They laughed and nudged each other. Some of them stretched out their arms to beckon passers-by. Ori walked past them as quickly as he could, trying to look away. His heart beat wildly. He could not say why. He had thought only children had to stand in line, like he did in school, all the way to prayer in the assembly hall. He didn't know adults could be made to stand that way too. Almost running now, he suddenly came up right against the theatre. It seemed to tear its way through the ground, a rugged mass of aged bricks, a giant iron grate. The gate was locked. He knew, but the smaller door next to it was not, and it pushed it open to enter the building. The lobby was half-lit and shadowy, weak music spilled over the past, the door to the main gallery. Locked and unlit, the little ticket counter on the right looked like an empty cage. On the walls, frayed posters of plays glowed in the shadows. The place snorted magic and fear in his stomach. A dense, wooden kind of fragrance filled his nostrils as he moved towards the door of the auditorium. He tiptoed through the door and stopped short, taking in a strange sight. The place's main lead was on the stage, alone. He was slightly moving his body to a song playing backstage. The song to which everybody was dancing that year, the actor wasn't quite dancing, but his movements were close to it. From time to time, he'd pause, flex his wiry muscles at an oblong mirror placed awkwardly in a corner, stare at himself, then st start stepping to the music as it picked up the tempo. From across the hall, he looked tiny, a little puppet in shiny clothes. Everybody in that empty hall looked tiny. The few people occupying the front row talked and laughed among themselves. Nobody paid attention to the man on stage. Suddenly, Ori heard his mother's voice. Stop there now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Firebird is my favorite novel by Shortrick, so a little biased towards that, yeah. Uh, but could you tell us a little bit about how the reading, writing became, uh, you know, from passion to thinking of it as a career or a vocation? Yeah. Fair enough. As I was saying, you know, with the joint IIT culture around you, <laughs> you are not quite encouraged. But I think, uh, you know, for me, in a way, um, I think if you come from a broken family, sometimes there's no one watching over you, and that becomes a freedom. So there's no father you know, peering over your head saying, like, oh, how much do you code in physics? Are you ready for the IIT? Can you get into brilliant tutorials? So that was kind of cool, actually. Like, I have. Nobody was watching and I was like going up on my own and I did, was free to do whatever I wanted. So I uh, that 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 worked and I, I think that 
made me like I'm going to study arts. I'm not going to do sciences, and I'm fine with that. But I think then you realize, especially I think there's a gender bias too. That if you're a guy who wants to do the arts, there's the pressure to, um, you know, um, kind of be serious about it. You know, sort of really. I mean, I've always seen in English honors classes in India that there are few guys, but the few guys who are, they are very determined. <laughs> <laughs> because they know having taken the chance, they they can't they can't mess up. <laughs> you know, there's like whole other, you know, of course. Um, um, and I um, I, I think I think we grew up at a slightly different time. Obviously, in the eighties and early nineties, you know, I think uh, before the digital generation, so to say, before Facebook and all that. Um, I um, you know, we uh, we read a lot, obviously. You know, there were no other distractions. So books were the only thing we read and read and read. Um, I wasn't much. I I never watched TV. I never liked except cricket, which I loved. So you know, I, I even now I don't have cable. I have Amazon and Netflix and all that, but I don't have cable. I don't have a smartphone. I I I gave up. I mean, after nine years in California, where I lived to my phone, when I came back to India, I stopped using a smartphone. So I'm like. So I am always telling Basu, you have to book me in Uber if you want me to somewhere because I can't book Uber. So I love that. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, I have, you know, I lived that life very much, and I've also having spent time in Silicon Valley. I've seen what technology can, how it can take over your life. But you know, I obviously love that, and I think in my mind, uh, there was no distinction between writing, reading, talking about books. Um, you know. And uh, I—that's why I think I never distinguish between writing fiction and writing criticism, writing essays, writing op-eds. And I still feel it's all writing. You know, I think um, you know people sometimes make a big deal about, oh, are you a critic or a writer? You know, as if a critic is not a writer. You know, criticism is not to dance or music. Criticism is also not to writing. So it's not like Arun Dutty Rai once said, like, "Oh, I'm called this writer activist." As if like sofa combat. You know, <laughs> so like, I'm a writer and an activist. You know, my activism is in my writing. I feel the same way that you know, my criticism is there in my writing. When I'm having in my novels, there are ideas. In my criticism, there are personal anecdotes. You know, there's no difference. But I think it goes back to my childhood of. Not really distinguish between these things. I mean, I do see, you know, today I see a lot of people wanting to become writers, but I think they read a lot less than what we did. You know, they read a lot less. One of my mm, colleagues at Stanford, uh, composition theorist Andrea Lansford, once said that, "Oh, we've moved from the age of consumption to the age of production. <laughs> people don't want to read; they want to write." <laughs> I think for me even now, even though I love writing, after a after a day of writing, I'm like, oh, I've written for three hours. I got to now read. I got to reward myself and read. So that's you know, that's always there. So I think I grew up. So what that meant was I um, could actually also contemplate. So I wanted to get an MFA after uh, my um, masters in literature in India. I wanted to go to the US and get an MFA. I wanted to, and I think the great thing about the MFA is that I was just talking to a student who has been accepted into an MFA program in dance. In Michigan, fully funded, and the best thing about the MFA is that that's the first time in your life when you get to call yourself a writer, especially if you're funded. Like for two years, I'm going to write, and uh, I don't have to worry about making an income. But ah, that's what I'm doing. Okay, I might be a writer in training, but take care. I'm still a writer. So that's the first thing, and I wanted that, and of course, you don't want to go to America because MFA is still very much an American thing. But I also wanted to do a PhD after that because I. I never distinguish. So I want to write fiction, but I also want to write criticism. And my criticism. And later, I realized my first critical book, *Prose of the World*, you know, is very essayistic. In fact, my book was about boredom. You know, what is the role of boredom in literature? Why is boredom fascinating? I don't think these kind of weird subjects would have come into my head if I wasn't also a novelist. Like, like, you know, people write about responsible things like. You know, like nation, post-colonialism, the body, performance. I'm like, no, I don't write about boredom. So I, I mean, even now I'm working on the idea of the amateur. So I, I think this idiosyncratic things come into my head because I, I think I approach criticism also from an artistic perspective. And um, so to answer your question, reading and writing were two sides of the same coin for me. I, I, I did that, and um, even when I explore. A, A, a critical. I mean, I was just telling in the workshop in the morning that you know I really feel 
uh, writing is what T.S. Eliot said, that it brings together different functions, you know, the smell of cooking, reading Spinoza, falling in love, and the sound of typewriter. And for me, it's like, you know, it's, it's very physical, it's very bodily, it's very intellectual, it's very emotional, and no part of the sensibility is left alone. And I think this all goes back to spending all those afternoons, you know, sitting in a ledge and reading a book and watching the sun go down. I have several wonderful memories about reading at a time. I started reading uh, in the afternoon and then when I finished the book, it was dark outside. So there's nothing like, you know, finishing a book and looking out and realize, oh my God, the world has changed. I didn't even pay attention. I didn't even realize the world has changed color. And uh, you can't quite do that if you're reading just in the morning or you're reading at night. That transition time. So I think afternoon and twilights have become very important in my writing also. The passage I read was that twilight hour when that child goes to look for his mother and it's afternoon, he comes from a playground and then he realizes that he's walked into a red light area where most of the theaters are. And then he realizes that, oh, in this place, evenings come differently. Evenings come because everybody sells flowers, because the clients buy flowers. And that time keeps coming back in my in my novels. Because I think, you know, this whole change, you know, I think sort of how the sort of and, and a lot of that has to do with my looking up for a book and looking outside and realize that oh my god, something has changed. That's fascinating. Uh, I wanted to ask because I think I've read your uh, essay about you know reading Amit Chaudhary at some point when you were young, I think Strange and Sublime Undress, right? and that playing a role in how you. Uh, and also, I think I've read your essay about the creative writing program uh, and how it had a certain. And you had some criticism about how it is uh, actually run in the US and your time there. So. Um, so to talk about Amit Chaudhary, maybe that, I mean, I don't know if that was an influence and the effect or the rather the question of vernacular, which you kind of, uh, I think in that essay you speak about vernacular and you also turn to Amitabh Ghosh's shadow lines and yeah, Maya Devi, I think I remember the reference you bring in of from shadow lines. So, so was there, was there a time when you wanted to write in Bangla, can you talk us through the choice of English as your and how do you tackle vernacular now? Possibly. Fair enough. I mean, the last thing I wrote in Bangla, Bashup, was when I was in grade 10, it was a play actually. I wrote a play in Bangla. <laughs> and then I decided, I was always bilingual, I decided to write in English for two reasons. Uh, one is the kind of crass reason I thought I'll get more readers, which is true in some ways. I mean, I'm here today in Bangalore talking about writing because I write in English. Um, but I also didn't realize that I lost a lot of readers. There were people in my family who could read me. Even today, when I write, I mean, there are many members of my family who can't read me. They might see some review, an interview of me in a newspaper, like, oh, your books are like, you know, translations are always there, but that original thing is lost. Uh, the other reason was I felt at the time, I think, a writer needs a tradition, a writer needs writers to whom they can relate and it felt like through English I could tap into a larger body, you know, there were more traditions, more, and I think at that moment again when I was being formed as a writer in the late 80s, early 90s to mid 90s to that whole period when I was going from school to college and all, uh, it wasn't a particularly fertile time for Bangla literature, you know, there's some writers, I think it has become even more insular, I think something to do with Bengal losing its economic <laughs> promise once, you know, very Marxist that way. Once the economic life goes out, artistic life also goes out. So you'll see the terrible quality in Bengali films now. So there's that sad part. I think obviously there's a reason why Bangalore is doing so well artistically because there's so much, so much economic life here. So Bengal is kind of lost. But uh, the thing is that once I started writing in English, and my first short stories were published by Writers Workshop Professor P. Lal, and all my characters drank scotch. They listened to jazz music, they made at parties, they talked about sports cars. I'm like, oh, I'm writing in English, I have to write about these guys. I mean, they can't have, they can't just you know, eat dal bhat and all that, they must do this kind of stuff. And that is when I read Amit Chaudhary's Strange and Sublime Address. I mean, I was in class 11, 
it was um, sometime in the early 90s, early two. Yeah, and the book was, and I read this wonderful description of, um, and those of you who know Bangla will recognize the word mocha, which is basically the flower of a banana, banana flower, and how it's described. And I'm like, wow, who would have thought? And I, today's workshop was talking about how, you know, I mean, I, I know a lot of words, obviously, I'm primarily anglophone, and yet, when it comes to certain spices, certain, um, you know, I, I feel like I don't know the English words. I'm like, okay, jeera, cumin, it takes me a few minutes. I'm like, oh, no, because I know these things in Bangla. You know, I know these things in, but most other things, there are plenty of words which I know in English, I don't know of. But certain spheres, and I was fascinated, you know, how um, even those aspects of life, which seemed almost anti-English, can be captured in English. So, I mean, Amitabh Ghosh's shadow lines, uh, the opening line is, begins with Maya Devi. And who was in England? Who says Maya Devi? That belongs to the world of 19th century Bengali novel. But he made it part of an English novel. And I think this has been an old problem with Indian English writers. Like Raja Rao says in the preface to Kantapura that the challenge is to write in English about a life not lived in English. How does one do that? So for me, I think that was a very important moment, an epiphanic moment when I realized that I can write about this reality in English. And that gulf, which felt like a challenge, is actually a wonderful thing. The gulf means something. So I think that was really important. And I think uh, I also wrote in that, in that that essay that in many ways, you know, English was the language I read in, but of course I performed a life in Bangla. There was that life, and of course, because my mother acted in Bangla, there was that performative life. So I think, in a way, when I wrote the Firebird, it was bringing all these loose threads of my life together. In many ways, it was there was a vernacular aesthetics, and this was after many years of life in the U.S., doing an MFA, doing a PhD, and my training of craft is very Western. So when I read a novel like I first read Ramanujan's translation of you know, um, Samskar, Anantamurti's novel, my first reaction was like, this is kind of a bad novel, it's like, it doesn't add up. And then I realized I was really responding to it in a very Western notion of craft, in a certain way of structuring sentences, a way of crafting. And then I thought I felt the same way about Manto, about, you know, um, all of the writers, reading them in English translation, because when I read, read it write in Bangla, I'm not questioning that. But when you read them in translation, so, you, you kind of expect English aesthetics, but these works do not offer English aesthetics. They offer a different kind of aesthetics, and it led to a radical revision of the notion of aesthetics. And that was the moment when I was writing The Firebird, that oh, I led to a change of that. So in many ways, it brought these strands together, you know, vernacular, English, performance, writing, they kind of came together. So I think, you know, you see the, the workshops, I mean, I just spent the whole afternoon Doing a workshop, so I'm not going to criticize the workshop too much because I'm like going back. It's like after I teach with teacher creating writing course on the last day, I always say, Now forget everything I said. <laughs> so it's all a lie. <laughs> like literature is sophisticated in form of lying. But um, it is true that you know the workshop can be, I think the whole idea of becoming a writer is a complex idea because it's something essentially unprofessional. You don't become a professional writer. You're just saying that many of the vulnerable writers have day jobs, like, you know, I think Anantamurti actually told me, Vivek Shambhak told me this, you know, the, you know, a couple of years back, that Anantamurti said the writers should have a job which is nothing to do with writing. They should be like an insurance agent or they should work in a bank or something. So they, they should have a completely different kind of a life. So, and I always tell my students, an 18-year-old, you want to become a writer? Like, you want to become a writer? Like, have a life. Live a world, get a job, you know, study economics, study English, study something. Then you're going to write about how we're going to. So I think the problem with the workshop is it does professionalize you. You end up thinking more about agents and awards and this. And so that I've actually done a lot in, you know, obviously to be a writer is kind of haunted by the anxiety. Oh, did I get reviewed? Oh, when is the Hindu review coming out? When is this award shortlist? When is this? And then, you know, part of it you can't help it. You, if you're going to live a life as a writer, a public life as a writer, you have to. And yet, when you're actually writing, if you can't banish those thoughts, then you'll never write anything worthwhile. So that 
the professional amateur divide, I think it's very important. You know, you have to be professional when it comes to your craft, and yet the soul of writing is always wide. It cannot be captured. And I think in some ways we need to preserve that wildness. I was telling today that, you know, you know, you can't have an interesting life because there's no such thing as an interesting life because all life is interesting. You know, all life is interesting. It's like your art is like that darkness inside the fridge. You know, it's dark when the fridge door is closed. And yet every time you open it, the light comes on. So you can never see the darkness. You know, it's like your shadow. Like, you know, the shadow is behind you. And the moment you look behind, the shadow is moved away. So there's something about art which is cannot be given a direct, hard stare. And my only reservation is that you know, professional workshops and all, they put that dark, sort of hard stare, which I think obviously in some art forms like filmmaking you need because there's so many technicalities. Writing is a matter of a lot of hard work and discipline, but there's also carelessness about it. And that carelessness cannot be given up. Yeah, uh, so I just wanted to, I think so most of your, I mean the three novels at least that I have read, they're all set in an institution. Uh, in Firebird, we have a lot of uh, theater, the Bengali theater world, that to commercial Bengali theater world. Then we have uh, in Saint of God, we have the school, uh, the residential school, and then in the middle finger is the academia, right? So uh, the university essentially, right? So, so I was very curious: is this is this a craft choice, or is there something else to this choice of always having a confined boundary to where your novel is traveling? Uh, within it, right? Uh, and uh, also, the uh, you know, if you could talk a little bit, because whenever any paragraph of yours is really, there is a lot of emphasis on the sensory aspects, right? I mean, you're writing about fragrances, incense, incense of God, and and that is having an impact on a character in a certain way. I mean, they are not just uh, ornamental writing, but they are in the part of the plot in some way. Right. So uh, I was very curious of these two things because we don't. I uh, I don't know if it's a conscious choice to do this or is this something. Where does it come from? Can I respond by? I think there's a passage I was thinking of, which I think in many ways answers both this question. So Middle Finger is the campus novel, which I I always wanted to do a contemporary campus retelling of the Corona Michaelavius tradition, the story. Like what does it mean to have a mentor and a student claim who doesn't. And I think we deal with these realities every day, you know, the university stories about caste or race in the US and, and institutions. I think Vasav is asking about institutions. And this is about a person's misgivings about institutions and uh, then about the right to create a certain kind of art. So I'll just read from the beginning of chapter two. Had she thrown her life away, she wandered by throwing away her dissertation. It was a meaningless thought. She remembered the dead end. But she always went back to the thought, a drug she could kick. She had taken the lead to follow the life of her poems. They came from anger and his like droplets on hot metal, the numb indifference to whiteness, its laughing, joking cruelty, the pain of blackness that she feared but wanted to love, blackness that had touched her kindly with a glint in its eye, brown that belonged to her, often invisible to the world. Little slippery stories that crawled in verse, speaking in tongues. They wanted to slap the world. They, she tried to gain her breath, but each time they came to life, they struck people and bruised them. A few of her poems had appeared in some of the experimental signs and quotas. The reptilian warrior, the lizard with the poison tongue, the archer in an armor of scales had slipped into imagery. They came alive under the weight of a job. A couple of her students showed that her poems had a spiky afterlife in the spoken word. They knew how to expose her. The words act on student performances on the various campuses scattered across the Raritan River, and on one evening popped up in a nightclub. Under the grainy yellow light, a young woman started to read out the poem from her phone, glancing around to find Megha in the crowd. The words crawled on Megha's skin like large hairy ants, and she slipped away unseen into the restroom where she locked herself up. There she would pretend to be sick or snort stuff, and she did, till someone threatened to bang down the door, and she stepped out meekly to take her place 
in, an, in the audience just when the whistling applause was dying down. Grainy light, antsy votes. The Instagram video circulated in stone circles, even though Megha cringed every time she wrote her own poem performed. She hoped the pain of hearing her words said aloud would help her become a better poet. She tried harder, but she hated the dance of her poems. There was something savage about their sound that she couldn't bear. The thought that she had written them was a slap on her face. They sounded alien. They claimed slimy muscles she did not possess. Suffering she had not suffered. How was that possible? They were beautiful, frozen sculptures of rage in print. How did they breathe so viciously when other people spoke them aloud? Hearing them, she felt she was claiming a pain that wasn't rightfully hers. The fluidity of sound scattered her dishonesty to bits. People love the sound of her poems. She smiled and squawmed. Because you brought up the sensory, I thought I here's an attempt to a poem, a poem doing the sensory, and yet it's so difficult because you, when you write something, this is my old sort of scepter of performance and writing. That when you write something, it's fine there, but it's suddenly spoken out. You're like, oh my god, did I write that? I tell my students, how do you write read it aloud? It sort of put you to shame. Like that word, and in this case, the protagonist writes poetry about race, and it's one thing to see, but when people perform it, it creates a whole level, a whole level of that power. So I just, I mean, I think these are, you're asking very important questions, you know, that institutions, I think, first of all, the institutions are everywhere, and we are right now sitting in one, I mean, there's no life outside it, we are all part of, we are all institutionalized, so to say, for better or for worse. But I think uh, it's like I said about education. Education, I'm, I think I'm fascinated with education. That is, I think, the running theme of everything I write, not just education in the sense of, you know, degrees and colleges and schools, but education in the sense of human growth. You know, the, the reason, sense in which Bill Langstone is a novel of education. And as I said, education is a fascinating paradox. It brings out the best in people, it offers mobility, and yet it's also a process of repression. Like Marxist theorists will say that, oh, it just makes you, oh, women are so taught to behave in a certain way, men are taught to behave in a certain way. Basically, we are all serving to be part of the capitalist theory. So that's all. Becoming only members, this, if you don't. And, and I think that's true. You, I mean, the traditional European Bildung slogan, which was very white and very male, um, basically about you grow up, you complete your education, you become a father, get a job, basically a productive member. And I think that I am really fascinated by institutional spaces which regulate this. And yet I think my characters spin out of control. They don't, they're not quite contained. So in the center of God, obviously, you know, this, this kind of austere, celibate atmosphere, you know, how does sexuality enter there? How does when you, um, basically, it's, it's like saying, oh, like, we, we are, we are selling because there are no women. And wow, that's like, that makes a chuckle to your thumb, like, oh, there's no women, there's no sexuality. Like, what, what do you, what do you say? And obviously that creates a different kind of sexuality. It's like that old kind of controversy about the Sabarimara temple, like, oh, you can't enter because it's women. They're like, like so, so then what happens to the men? And then you know, there's that whole, so I was fascinated with the relationship of monks and their relationship with, you know, the male students. and So there's always something institutions trying to enact and enforce, and there's also something to kind of step, sort of slip out, something else is happening. It's like, um, you know, I think in many ways, obviously the Dora Ekalavia story is a story about institutions. You know, what happens when a student who can't get admitted to an institution claims right to it? You know, so Ekalavia goes and tells Dora that, you know, um, I um, I want to learn from you. And um, Jonah says, sorry, I can't teach you because um, you're not a prince. You know, I only teach princes. And um, and isn't that story happening everywhere? You know, isn't that story, isn't education today, which is such a wonderful thing, is about disparate access. You know, who gets access? And I mean, having taught at, at a place like Stanford for nine years and now teaching at Ashoka University, I deal with these questions every day. I mean, an institution like Ashoka, which is um, very new in the very socialist educational landscape. Now you have this place where you you pay 10 lakh rupees to get a bachelor's degree and yet people are doing it all the time. And uh, and it's it's in the middle of Sonipat, Haryana. It's like right outside, it's like these villages. 
And I think it's not just us, our students are haunted by this anxiety every day that what are we doing? We're talking about Shakespeare and Joyce and macroeconomics and this, and people outside are all illiterate. So I, and I've seen this, you know, I've seen this in Stanford too, like, you know, oh, there's a lot of these institutions, obviously, they can give you, they can give you uh, scholarships. I'm like, yeah, you're this poor black student from Ireland, and you have, you're here in a scholarship, so you're fine. But what happens in spring break when uh, your, uh, your, uh, your roommates go to South France, you know, or, and then you go back to your, you know, sixth floor walk up in Harlem, and you're like, you know, what happens when they go out in one night in San Francisco and spend like, Five hundred dollars, you know, and the same thing happens in Delhi. You know, the kids they just they, they go out and they, they spend like thirty, forty thousand rupees in a night. They're, they're people from those families. I don't even know what kind of parents give that kind of money to you know, their kids, but this happens. So it's like you know, it doesn't end in a scholarship. You can a scholarship can give, give you a seat, but you know, it can't give you the social life. And these students talk about it all the time. That you know. Uh, I am not part of this life I, because I have to speak English in a different way. I can't. And I think even as teachers, we face this. Like, you know, as an English teacher who teaches literature and writing, occasionally you'll see a student who struggles with English, doesn't come from an English speaking background, and yet they bring this wonderful local vernacular energy. I have had students who want to write, but they haven't read much English writing, or they've read Hindi. You know, they've read something some other language. I have a student who, uh, every word he wrote, every sentence he wrote, felt like translating from Bangla, Bangla. I was a student from Bangladesh. And then I think your challenge is how do you get these students into an English classroom? So, what I'm trying to say is that we are placed in the position of Drona every day. We are asked to be Drona. We are always asked to choose between the Arjuns and the Galavias. And it's very easy to train the Jews, right? It's much harder to train the Galavias. And how does, and it's not just harder in a social sense, it's also harder intellectually because, you know, I mean, for better for worse, I received a pretty privileged education, I went to good schools and all. And then I'm like, I don't even know, you know, how, but then that's why I think teaching is always a process of learning. So institutions are fascinating, they open up avenues. They close doors, they're liberating, they're repressive, they're everything. And institutions are like, you know, they're like they're like science. You know, it's what you do with it, it's power. But you can use it, you can abuse it. And I think in our country institutions are both used and abused. And um, so I'm fascinated by that. And I think in my life as an educator, in my life as a non-fiction writer, I try to do my best to put institutions in the best way. But I think in fiction, it's all beauty and its ugliness comes out. I can't spend because in fiction, sometimes ugliness is the most beautiful. Ugliness is the most magnetic. So how can I say no to that? Great, lot of ideas in there. But institution clearly is a great plot choice. Yeah. Let's just say that. <laughs> uh, but I, I wanted to sort of ask this question, uh, like you're prolific, you write columns, you write columns for Outlook, you write a column for LA Review of Books, uh, and every week I see you, you know, writing one column or the other. Then you write these academic essays. I remember reading Critic as an Archer, your essay, which, which is quite long and quite dense as an academic writing should be. And then you also have your novels, fiction, and in the pandemic, you not of the novel, right? So, so I wanted to ask you how how is this writerly life? I mean, how do you wake up and you just write for eight hours? I mean, how does it work? You know, some of us need to learn from you about it. So, if you can talk about your writing habits, probably and uh, and yeah, because writing is difficult, as many of the people who have tried to write to have experience. Well, it's a sickness. <laughs> <laughs> Writing is a sickness. <laughs> so if you think one of my characters say in this book, like poetry is a sickness. You know, it's about how it's about teaching poetry is like how do you make others sick? So you are infected by this virus, you gotta give the virus to others. <laughs> so you know it's like that. So I understand in the pandemic that that joke became very sensitive. <laughs> you know, the virus, you know, like could be you should wear masks and no? all, but I came out of that. So um, no, I mean I don't know, I should say one 
weird thing about my writing people always ask me how do you write you know like so i very sit in a place you know like i don't have a place because i walk and write <laughs> so this is the thing i mean i, I think you know, this is and i think this is a bit of that in the center called of walking and reading and a lot of us have this habit of walking and reading and i'm like i can't sit and write so what i do is i find any high spot just i put my laptop and i'm obviously not actually walking while i'm writing but i obviously stand and type sentences and in between i'm pacing so if i've written for 5 hours a day i walk for 5 hours <laughs> which is not a bad thing actually i have to say <laughs> i just walk the whole time i think i saw i think like, there are some other i think honest hemingway had a habit of standing and writing you know if you walked there was a photo i saw of hemingway standing and writing and he had some type calves man really, <laughs> really, really, really sexy calves I and mean, that's not my goal <laughs> to get my calves in a pool but I mean, he was a, uh, he was in the pool fighting and all that stuff and he was there all kinds of things going but I'm just very unsporty that way but I do walk I think the reason is uh, I'm excited you know I feel when I'm writing I am in a state of stir and I can't sit I mean as I was telling you I mean it's quite quite amazing that I'm sitting and having this conversation clearly moving a lot but I was starting teaching the workshop in the afternoon like I can't sit you know I got to I got to stand up you know, I got to stand up I got to sit up so I think my body this is the whole performance anxiety that I'm talking but my body has to move and uh, I find that very I find that really nice because for one thing there are chances of falling asleep <laughs> so if you are reading and then you don't get drowsy but you're walking and you don't fall drowsy because you're walking and uh, writing I'm just too excited. So, but uh, I, like? I do like to write in the mornings. I do like to write. I'm a, I'm a morning person. So, by the time it's 11, I'm really dozing off. So, I'm kind of, sometimes I'm pretty bad at parties. <laughs> that is there's something really interesting. I'm like, I'm just, and I wake up at 6. I do wake up at 6. Pandemic messed up this routine a little bit, but not too much. I still kind of an early, early, early morning person. And I, I like to write in the mornings. Uh, but sometimes I read, sometimes and I'm doing different things. As you know, when you write a book, you're not always writing, you're editing, you're revisiting. But it, I do like to spend a part of the morning thinking about it. In a way, when I, you know, if I'm teaching, I'm like, I feel like if I write and if I've written, then the rest of my day will go well. Now I can teach, now I can do something else, now I can go to a meeting. But first the writing. And of course the easiest things too. So I, um, I'm... I think the pandemic has been very strange because in many ways, I mean, I think those of us who have been fortunate enough to, you know, keep reasonably good health, you know, and uh, not suffer loss of jobs or loss of incomes, I think we are very fortunate that way and we must recognize our privilege because it's previously taken a massive toll on so many people on so many walks of life. But I always say that it's been very strange for writers because uh, we lost the world. You know, it's like my daughter, um, you know, she was nine when the pandemic started and she one day she told me like, you know, Papa, I have forgotten what it's like to feel the air on your face because I haven't stepped out without a mask and I have just don't remember it. And she was saying it in a way innocently. And I realized, yes, you know, we, they, we didn't even remember what it's like. So basically we lost the world. There was a time when we didn't know what street life is like, what, you know, going to carnival going to a movie all of these things have lost from our life so it's a great depression so i was i was seeing a lot of students writing about you know very netflixy very you know you know very digital space very speculative and i always think like this is all very well but you know step out on the indian streets there's an epic you couldn't step out right you couldn't go there was a loss of that world but perversely there was a gain of time to write because we were not going out we we're not traveling I actually wrote a lot, I mean, as you probably know, because I did. It's like, I mean, what do you do? You like, you go to write. You know, I wrote this novel. Um, I wrote a lot of columns. I was writing a lot on education because I was very concerned with the impact the pandemic was having on our life. There was a there was a girl in J.D. Shiram College um, came from a difficult background. Um, she committed suicide because she couldn't get a laptop. And um, again, she had a scholarship to fund her studies. But um, but she didn't have enough to, and suddenly everything, learning moved to, to the screen. And there's so many horror stories I've heard and written about, the stories about, you know, little boys and girls in schools climbing 
to the top of their houses, to the top of trees in rural areas to get signal. You know, there are whole families where three kids have to do their classes on one phone, you know, and they, and that phone belongs to the father who also has to depend on the phone for his livelihood. So it's like, you know, there are people, and it, I think the digital divide really brought out the division in our society in a very brutal way. And so there was much, I wrote about these things, and I think in many ways, the world of the middle finger was also shaped by, you know, as I said, the Kalavias are there today. Um, so it was shaped by that. So it was a very strange time. Like as times are, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times always. It was obviously the worst of times for most of us, but in some ways, you know, artists are a perverse lot. Worst times are sometimes very productive for them because pain is generative, pain and suffering makes you create and I um, yeah I, I have I have written and I feel that you know I, I mean I and I think in many ways it's continuous we are very lucky to have professions you know teaching writing where there's no dividing line I mean I'm 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 working now I go to a bar I'm having a conversation I'm still working because I'm thinking I go to sleep it's like the that joke I repeated with Richard Feynman, like Manhattan Project, Feynman was asked by the military people, like everybody here in the army locks in their hours, your scientists don't. And Feynman says that my scientists get their best ideas while they're sleeping. So how do you log in those hours? So obviously we are lucky. So in a way, but I know writers who stopped writing. There were people who found it hard to read for a while. I think in many ways, our reading habits have changed drastically from the pandemic because people feel they're reading in this crisis-laden world. They have no time for poetry. They have no time for fiction. They only have time for, you know, kind of investigative journalism. And, and I think that's a loss too because in critical times, our attention to the aesthetic uh, seems like a luxury, seems like an indulgence. But believe me, it's not because art refracts crisis in unpredictable ways, it throws new light. And I realize that in my own writing, I realize that in reading books about it. But um, but yeah, I don't even know. I mean, I, I guess it just comes. I mean, there is discipline, of course. I mean, I say that writers like to have this kind of bumper sticker on their fridge, write drunk, edit sober, sometimes literally. <laughs> but yeah, you, you write, there's a part of you which just comes flowing and then you write and then you take your time and edit. So often with my books, I might finish a manuscript in like nine months, but I might edit it for the next four years. So I've done that. I mean, I, if I were, I took it, you know, I think 10 or 15 months to write it, but I edited it for four years because I'm a very hard editor. I write quite fast, I, but I, I'm very finicky. I delete, I cut, I do all of that. So. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's a, I mean, I was never very good at discipline when other people told me what to do. Okay, go and study for IIT. I was not very good. But once I decided this is my thing, I'm very disciplined. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I'm always amazed by how much writing you get done in a week. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's in the interest of time, maybe we should open up. So if you have questions, uh, yeah, and more. Thank you, Saifal, for that. It was fascinating. Especially the way you were able to bear your personal life to us and related to not, not an easy thing to do. Um, I have two questions and they're not related unfortunately. Um, the first one you said something very interesting in passing. You said that uh, you write criticism from an artistic perspective. Um, I'd like you to expand on that a bit. What, what do you mean exactly by that? What is it to write criticism from a non-artistic perspective also? Uh, the second question is uh, related specifically to your fiction and particularly the fiction which has a child as a protagonist. The question I had was, did you find yourself thinking about vocabulary? Because what words will a child use to describe what he or she is seeing, experiencing, etc. 
uh, uh, do, do you think that was important to you because there would be the danger otherwise of putting an adult's perspective and feelings into the child's mouth? Yes, and I, I thank you for, you know, sort of what you said about bearing. I think it's very, um, very difficult. Yeah, it is very difficult for two very strange reasons. One is you feel, you feel like if you're writing about your life or using elements, you kind of think like you're thought of as a lesser writer. Like you, you know, just play music for your whole life. But that's not true. I think it actually is harder you know, to, in many ways to write about it. Um, and um, I, I, I did. It took me a long time to even sort of note the similarities between some of my own life and the firebird because I. Um, it was obviously painful. I, I always still say that I don't think I could have written that novel if my mother was alive, because uh, in some ways her death and it's a book powered by death. Um, and it's difficult. I mean, even with the scent of God, I mean, I suddenly, every June, um, I get this set of questionnaires from journalists like, so what does it feel like to be a gay man in, you know, post 377 India? Like, you know, just find a, I've written a queer novel, so there are obviously assumptions and this, and then my publicist and publisher gets questions like, is he gay or is he not? And like, is that even important <laughs> to know? So and then I put on panels in queer literature festivals, like who gets to tell a story, an artist or a queer artist. So I think the personal and the fictional is really interesting. And especially on, you know, when you write about certain subjects, can you write about queerness and these, these marginal spaces if you don't identify. So the personal part is very, very, very difficult. But, um, you know, to answer your question, I'll just take the child question first because it's related to fiction. Um, I think it's really interesting because when you write anything, fiction, non-fiction, uh, you have to acknowledge it, its status as a crafted work. So the moment you know that, because for, for one thing I said the question of language, often you are writing something that is did not happen in English. So the very fact of writing it in English is an act of craftedness. You are crafting a narrative. Even life doesn't come to us as a narrative. You, you craft it. Like I was telling the students that the stream of consciousness writers in modernism said that, oh, this is how the mind thinks. You think something, then you get a smell, you think again, you get hungry, you think again, you get distracted. This is how the mind works. But try to put that in writing, people are going to be very confused. Because we have a certain expectation in processing thought. We expect biographical order and that has to do with the way we are taught. Our, right from school, we are taught that there is a certain way of processing information because obviously people are not taught language with literature in mind. They are taught language to be a productive citizen so that you can write, add, copy, political speeches, everything, not just about business memos. So though that's also part of language. So we can't take reality. So what you're saying is, uh, one must first acknowledge that I'm not reporting reality exactly the way it happened. It is there is craft. That being said, it has to have very similitude. It has to have very similitude. And uh, I think, you know, it is one thing it made it. It made um, both my second novel, The Firebird, and the third novel, The Center Call, it made the language very simple. Because obviously I was using a child's vocabulary. And both these child's and center call, the child is slightly older. It starts at around 13 and 18. Five word, it's bit from basically five. Five is the first scene, 10 to 14, so slightly younger. And um, it gave me a simplicity, a lucidity of style, which was a bonus. But I wasn't thinking of writing like that, but because I was writing from a child's perspective, it became that simple. But it's not just about language. I mean, I loved exploring those confusions, which an adult don't have. And because these are novels about children, but they're not children's literature. They're actually very adult literature, you know. And, the, and I guess the beauty would be that adults would read things and they'll understand things the narrator would not, because they are talking about situations which they are not getting. And I was telling students about the beauty of the unreliable narrator, when a narrator, you know the narrator is lying or dishonest or not getting things, so the narrator is mad. You know, that's one of the greatest beauties of reading fiction, that you, because you enter fiction holding a narrator's hand, 
And then you realize the narrator is not getting this right. The narrator is saying things that are wrong. The narrator is saying things that are lies. And that's a great moment. I always tell people the Unreal Island narrator is fascinating. You must explore that. Because we feel like the narrator must always tell the truth. No, the narrator is most interesting when they're not telling the truth. Right? And I think the child protagonist has really allowed me to explore the unreliable narrator. And at the same time, similar to my adult narrator, see, this is what is happening. But see, the guy is not getting it. So that's the beauty. So that's, that's my answer. I mean, it's a long discussion, but I'll move on to the next question about criticism. Uh, I think, you know, I, for me, criticism and art have never been disparate functions. But the fact is, we train differently. There are, and there, there's a reason, I think, you know, when you talk about literature, you talk about it as a critic or something. But um, but that's the problem of training. You know? Like, as I say, when the difference is not ontological. In ontologically, even history and geography don't exist separately. It's always together. But we study them as subjects separately because that's easier. I think that different between criticism and art is also similar, that we separate them for our own convenience. Okay, this is English class, this is creative writing class because it's easy. But in reality, I don't think those those things those things matter because uh, I, I know not all writers and critics and not all critics think of you know criticism as a kind of an artistic activity but in my mind I mean, that's why I gave the example of writing about boredom I don't think I could have chosen that as a subject of academic study if I wasn't a writer I'm like boredom restlessness anxiety these are like Interesting. And there are those responsible subjects academics write about, or how is the nation represented in post partition literature? How is the. And these are things I feel we inherit from a certain social scientific vision of these are the important subjects one must write about. I have never drawn the important subjects as a critic. I mean, I'm interested in the really strange, bizarre subjects. And because I think the strange, bizarre subjects also tell us some very important stories. So I think, you know, um, I think it has all everything to do with our education system. We are not educated to think of them as unified activities. We are educated to think of them as separate. But I think I think the best criticism is when it's you know when it's when it's embodied. You know, when you, when you don't just read a text to for its meaning. But you read the text for its sentences, its sensoriness, what it misses, the oddities, the silences, the freaks. I mean, it's not a search for meaning. It's a search for meaning which has forgotten what it's looking for. It starts wandering, it starts looking left and right. It gets distracted. So I love criticism which wanders and loses its way. I tell my students in my classes, sometimes hold a fiction workshop in the Dhaba, open. I say, yeah, yeah, let's have a discussion. But you know, Listen to what they're talking about in the next table. They're gossiping. So listen to that. You know, never miss gossip. <laughs> you know, it's very important. What I'm saying is important, but never miss gossip. If you miss gossip, you'll never understand literature. So I think it allows you to do such irresponsible things. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question, but these are very important questions. Thank you. Yeah, so I was just thinking of asking you this. I've often heard you say that. Uh, to be a writer, you don't need to really have an interesting life, but have an interesting relationship with life. Yeah. So I find it very interesting, you know, very fascinating the way you look at it. If you could just dwell on it some more. I said this today afternoon workshop and, and my, you know, favorite two examples here are the opposite poles of I talked about Joseph Conrad who, you know, who basically traveled around the world had this incredible sailorly adventures and started writing at the age of 40. So he was really had a lifetime of experience. On the other hand, there's someone like Emily Dickinson, who literally never left a room and lived the life of a nun and read this explosive poetry. So clearly there's no matrix. There's no matrix. But I think there's this rumor spread by Western interest that you must do certain things to be a writer. You must drink a lot, you must take drugs, you must dress in black, you must have sex with lots of people. I mean, this is a whole narrative that is called, and there's a reason, you know, there's a whole the way the modernist artists, the left bank, the you know, Harlem, the whole sort of going to Paris, this whole narrative. There, there's a reason behind that. I don't want to go into that. It's a whole other discussion, but it's all false. I think anybody, it's like. And who's to define what's interesting? You know, it's about, it's a matter of what you observe. You know, it's like when someone asks Chekhov, 
how do you get your ideas from your stories? He said, put your cigarette down on the ashtray and write a story about it. And that was, you know, the impetus behind my writing of Roll of the World that, you know, suddenly we are interested in banal things. We are not interested in grand, epic, you know, stories of love and war and great nations fighting. We are interested in the cigarette on the ashtray. We are interested in the mark on the wall. We are interested in these kind of bizarre subjects. And modernists, exactly. And I mean, Madame Bovary, the great modernist novel, is essentially about boredom. A woman has affairs because she's bored. And who would have thought only a modernist artist can make a board of the driving engine? So I think um, these marginal things are actually sometimes the most interesting. That is, of course, what the modern reality has taught us. But, you know, I really believe that people often say that, oh, uh, the, the, the one of the things you hear most is like, oh, you know, I came to Delhi because I am from rural UP and nothing happens there. And I want to be a writer. I want to write I came to Delhi. Or, you know, I said, I came to Bombay because, like, I oh, I came, I came to Paris. I came. This has happened forever. James Joyce felt that. James Joyce felt that in Dublin, it's a dead city. This Everything is boring. I must go to Paris and be the writer. And when he went to Paris, what did he write about? He, wrote, he never wrote about Paris. He wrote about Dublin. <laughs> he writes about the boring place you leave behind. You know, you, you D. H. Lawrence. He comes to Bloomsbury because of a fashionable set. He doesn't write about the fashionable set. He writes about the mining country. So I think it's the reality with which you have a visceral relationship, the reality which connects to you. And sometimes the most dead provincial world is the most fascinating because. You have an organic relationship with it. You know, fashionable places are often crafted. They are crafted by migrants, migrants like me actually, you know, or migrants like many of us in the room. We craft this place, you know, and yet part of me in growing up in provincial North Calcutta, I have been haunted by that reality, that gossipy neighborhoods, that mean, that culture, that narrow lanes, you know, they have always stayed with me. So I think, you know, I think everybody has an interesting life. Everybody. Everybody has an interesting life. The key thing is whether they find it interesting. If you don't find your own life interesting, you'll be able to write it. But you have to find the interesting parts about it. And sometimes the most interesting parts are things that you miss. So I think that myth of the interesting life is to go somewhere, to become a writer, to go around life with carrying a notebook. Oh, that's the end of it. You will never... You, you lose the fun of living, you lose the fun of writing. Be careful, be careless. I mean, I always said that I can't write about something I'm experiencing right now. I'll write about it five years later. Give me give me five years time, I'll tell you what was important about this evening. Today I can't. Five years later, I'll remember, I don't know, something strange, some mark on the wall probably. You know, <laughs> there's no cigarette here. So maybe something, something, something really strange I'll remember. So rely on memory. Don't have to go by... I'm not a fan of headlines. I'm interested in the that little ad in buried, that little backstory. Those things interest me more. But there are many different kinds of writers. That's my approach. Yeah, I mean, you yourself also traveled all the way to US and finally wrote about North Calcutta. Yes, I did. Now that I think After attempting to write about jazz and. <laughs> Supposing an idea comes to you in the night. Like you said, that. <laughs> so. Then you immediately sit to the laptop and write, or you think, uh, okay, I'll note it and uh, write the next day, morning, something like that. Right. So right. I just want to yeah, get yeah. it. So these are all questions that have haunted me in many ways. I, of course, I have been inside a shower and like, oh, this is the title for my book. And like, do I finish the shower or do I? <laughs> you, know, do I, I mean, you can't even carry up, like, you can't even carry up. You know, iPad inside the shower, so it's like, okay, I'm going to forget it. Of course, dreams are terrifying because you always forget what the dream is. Otherwise, that's why Freud used to say, write down your dreams the first thing, otherwise, you're going to forget it. Or tell it, even the act of narration is important. Or the person you told you will remember. You might forget, but the person you told, they will remember the dream. So, retention is. Um, no, I, I, I don't think I think about writing all the time. But it sounds strange, but my entire life has become inseparable from the writing identity. So even when I'm not thinking about writing, I'm somehow thinking about writing. 
because uh, my life has because it's a very really personal thing right i mean sometimes say that i wish i was a stock broker or something then i could just do my nine to five job and then come back and you know talk about stuff and then like uh, sometimes people say that oh you're just such a unromantic person or i'm like because i it's like the blue she was told in answer the band like you know you 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 talk about war in a very mechanical way of like you know, I'm a professional so I can't talk about it. <laughs> so it's like so there are real costs to making something passion part of your profession because it becomes you can't separate the two. And um, I uh, I guess it somehow as I said you don't know at the moment you just don't know at the moment what will haunt you. I mean you just because memory is a wonderful editor. You know you. you know what matters in a situation in either 5 minutes later or 5 years later when you are inhabiting the moment you don't know because it's too close to you so i am struck by things i mean i when i was living in the us i never thought i'd write about america because i thought it was america is kind of a boring place for you it's very efficient but quite boring uh, i don't about india now i've lived in india for 6 years i'm writing about america So clearly, there's something about the absence that is more interesting. It's not about any place is boring or interesting, but it's not there. So um, I also find that when I have an idea, when I write it down, I kind of lose it because writing is it's like you know Socrates said something very interesting um, that um, oh this new technology called writing it's very dangerous. It will make you forget, right? Because when you write. You have no obligation to it. Like I still remember a time when people used to remember phone numbers. Right? You know, I mean, I still remember that. Who knows phone numbers anymore? But the moment technology takes over, you kind of give it up. You just sort of say. And then I was reading another memoir, and somebody said that they were speaking this Ethiopian guy, and he and there was a Canadian guy talking to Ethiopian guy, white Canadian guy. That no, a Ethiopian guy could name fourteen generations. Of his on his father's side and his mother's side, and this guy, the Canadian guy, is saying like, "Oh, I have it in my family tree, but I can't tell you at the top of my head. It's there because it's there. You you feel like I don't need to know it anymore. So these are the traditional knowledges, you know, in our culture too, sort of liturgical, sort of shruti, the whole idea that you remember things in your person. I found there's a strange truth in that because when I Right. So these days, when I find a compelling idea, I don't write it. That obligates me to ruminate on it. That obligates me to sort of it. Just kind of stays in my body. When I write it, it's kind of externalized. Oh, it's out there. It's done. I can refer to it, but I don't. So in a way, I let it eat me from inside, and then, and then sometimes one needs to time to go to. So see if it's really, really is an idea. I mean, you're asking me about that Bitcoin story. I was, I was telling you that it's sometimes ideas seem very interesting in an objective way, but it's not about. The, I mean, I've seen so many pandemic stories. I can't tell you. And honestly, most of them are quite boring because everybody feels so. This incredible thing happened in our life. This dystopia came true, and most of those that are published works are they are not really moving. They're not really interesting because it's too interesting. It's too disruptive. I think people need time. I think the great pandemic stories will start coming five, ten years from now. People will understand what it really meant. We are still too close to it. So I think it's not about whether something is interesting. What it means to you, that is what is imp- important. I mean, obviously, even for me, you know, what my mother's life as an actress. I didn't understand it at all while she was living. While she was there, I had endless conversations with her. It's many years after her death that I just realized, and I don't think it would have been possible, you know, if it. And for me, at least, the attraction of that which is lost is very powerful. So once it gets lost, I want to regain it. So, a lot of rambling there. Great. I think we have time for one last question. Yeah. Actually, this is a, it's just a connection I made, and I don't know whether you would agree with it. You know, this whole image you started with, you know, watching your uh, mother die on stage, and then seeing, uh, you know, I mean, you being agonized, 
and then realizing that it wasn't true. And I was wondering about, you know, that idea of what is honest and what is true. What impact, you know, this part of your childhood had on that, you know, like your mother being this very important parent figure whom you would ordinarily expect to be truthful and honest. And then, you know, yeah. something like this. And I was, I was drawing my wild connection to your interest in the unreliable narrative. I don't know if you can yeah. comment. So I think that's that's very fair. And I think that actually that touches on a very important part of my creative process because I think I realized I, 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 I have uh, two kids now, eight and eleven. And I realized children find stories captivating, especially when they're really young. Now they are too old to believe it because they think it's true. It's literally true. And I think when the time comes when you realize stories are made up is actually a right. It's a big it's a in a way a jolt, like oh these things are not true, you know, the all the kings and queens and demons. So that that mom that reality check is very important. And I think that moment came from that reality check that you know what is enacted is not necessarily true. But in this case I realized there's a curious hypocrisy when it comes to the lives of women performers. That women who act maybe not so much true now, but even in my childhood. Um, women who acted were seen, oh, if she's doing these kind of roles, you know, she must be suspect, you know, she must be, I mean, we all saw what happened with the Harvey Weinstein scandal and what it means to be an actress and why actresses are expected to do things which actors are not necessarily, so there is this whole hypocrisy. And uh, I think in, in, in the fire world what happens is Ori obviously grows up to realize that is not literally true. But at some level, the confusion stays because he sees people around him judging his mother for doing certain kinds of roles. And I think in many ways, we have double standards for men and women. If a man does certain things on stage, he can just shed his role and come back. But if a woman does it, then she's seen as, oh, you are not supposed to do this. So I think the most fascinating thing for me was that that child vision was on a factual level false, but on a deeper level it was actually true. One last question, Aditi, since you raised hand at the same time. Uh, yeah, so uh, I just had this mundane question about writing fictional characters. And how important is the aspect of relativity while you write fictional characters? Right. Especially in institutions. Uh, like absolutely, we also touched on this to the afternoon. I think art, and this is not just fiction, Art is this endless tension between the alien and the familiar. You want to see characters whom you relate to, whom you understand. You want to say, oh, that character I know, there's somebody in my neighborhood who's just like that. And we also want the opposite. We want to be shocked. So art is about creating an effect which is both familiarizing and shocking at the same time. You have to satisfy this paradoxical demand. If you find a character who is exactly like somebody you know in life, you're like, okay, that's fine, that's not a big deal. And if you find a character which is so alien that you have you can't relate at all, you're like, where did that come from? You want both. So often I tell my students that you know when you end a story, the reader should say, uh, reader should first say, Oh my god, I didn't see that coming. But wait, on second thoughts, that makes sense. Now, the reader says, uh, Oh my God, where did that happen? I didn't see that coming. Then your goal is fail. Or if the reader says, Oh yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Neither is the satisfactory response. The satisfactory response is when the reader feels both. When the reader first says that, Oh my God, I didn't see that coming. But now that you think about it, it makes sense. So this two-step thing, that art must both shock and create empathy. How do you get that in the same moment? So characters must be like that. Characters must shock and draw empathy, both. Fantastic. I think it's time for us to wind up. So thank you, Shaikhat, for joining us today. It's really, really a great pleasure to have you from on behalf of Total Fuzz the Arts. And thank you. Uh, and a round of applause for Shaikhat. Oh. Uh, his books are on sale outside if you want to pick up one signed copy. 
cases here. Uh, uh, other than that, you follow the total funds CRs if you're not following them already. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. To be Bangalore, to be Kamsuk, to be Sasha, and to be with the total funds. He's also, uh, there's a book launch event of Shortcut tomorrow if you want to at uh, Trippy Goat Cafe. Trippy Goat Cafe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 about creating women characters. <laughs> so, men writing women, we call it. So, Shashi and I will talk about how you create characters that are different from yourself. Yeah, he's in conversation with the author, Shashi Deshpande, our own Bangalore author. Yeah. Okay, thank you all. Uh, good night. Thank you.